So, thank you so much for clapping. Let's snap throughout. That's a thing the young people have taught yeah, me. Yeah, it yeah, It doesn't yeah, yeah. interrupt the flow of conversation. It's Got great. It. Um, this is an incredible movie. Appreciate it. I was just telling Bo that I saw Hereditary, and I reached out to A24, and it, you know, Hereditary is this horrifying, disturbing movie, and they were like, we have eighth grade two for you. And I was like, that's going to deliver, I think. And it absolutely does, despite nice. very little trauma. Um, happening in the film mm. uh, and I think a lot of what this movie is is you're you're bracing for impact in these all-encompassing tiny moments um, in a lot of ways it's about anxiety which I think is what you set out to write about can you tell us how you connected the story of anxiety to the story of being in eighth grade yeah really I just tried to set out to talk about how I was feeling at the time that I was wanting to write this which I was feeling nervous I was feeling strange I was feeling uncertain of myself and the world. I didn't know how to process it. I didn't know how to process myself. I was sweating a lot. Eighth grade, you know what I mean? Like kind of, like it really f did feel like that. It felt like we were sort of maybe, feels like our culture is in s kind of going through a bit of an eighth grade moment. It seems like it's functioning at an eighth grade level maybe right now. <laughs> um, so it felt like maybe a good way to go after it. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I didn't set out to make a story about a young person. I, I really just set out to make a story about how I was feeling. Um, and then stumbled on this world. But I've always, I, I'd always been interested in middle school. I felt like it was incredibly underrepresented for a reason. I think we want to remember high school and we, we want to forget middle school. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a, lot, a lot of what's happening when you're, when you're in middle school on the internet, you have a sense of permanence that you have kind of learned in reverse. So you, you are, you know, you're entering the world, you're entering, right. being catapulted to celebrity at a time when we didn't understand a thing that is now ingrained yeah. in the young person's experience of middle school. Yeah. Uh, how did you study that from the current perspective? You know, I just really defer to the kids. I mean, like, I think a problem sometimes, I, I, I did not want to make a nostalgic movie. I did not want to make a movie that was a projection of my own experience or my own, or my own past experience. Um, I didn't want it to be a memory. Because I was, you know, my disconnect from the world and from the main character is twofold. You know, I was never a 13 year old girl. I was also never 13 now. You know, and both of those things, I think, lend themselves to a very specific experience that I couldn't know. So it really was just like let the kids author themselves and just. The good thing about the generation, you want to learn anything about them? They are posting everything about themselves online. So, like, <laughs> the research is there. You just have to, uh, you have to clear your Google history when you're researching. <laughs> when you, when you, when you're researching middle school pool party, you might want to uh, <laughs> clear the search history once in a while. <laughs> so you watched a lot of YouTube videos for this, and I, we have a clip of one that is in the film. If we can play that now. Hey guys, Kayla back here with another video. Uh, okay, so the topic of today's video is putting yourself out there. Um, okay, so like, what does that mean? Where is there? Well, there can be anywhere that you wouldn't usually go, you know, maybe because it's like weird or scary or um, something like that. <laughs> that is, uh, so that's a wonderful, amazing part of the movie is she, Kayla puts, for anyone who hasn't seen it, can, makes these YouTube videos and is exploring herself through them. Mm. Can you talk about that and how you saw young people kind of figuring out their sense of self yeah. by performing it. It was the initial impulse for the script, was just these videos of young people trying to express themselves online. I watched hundreds of them. The boys tended to talk about Minecraft and the girls tended to talk about their souls. So it was like, <laughs> I'm probably gonna write about a girl. Um, but it really was like the failure to try to articulate yourself was so compelling to me. And it's the thing that for me in a lot of teen movies is erased. It's, it's kids that are, yeah, fumbling through the circumstances of their life and the circumstances of their life aren't perfect, but they're able to perfectly articulate articulate their own place within it. And you know, when you feel young people in film that have an ability to articulate themselves that is suspiciously similar to a screenwriter's ability to articulate themselves, you know, part of me, part of the experience of being young, of being alive, being anybody is is the gulf between the idea of the thing you have in your head and the way it comes out of your face, you know? <laughs> um, and so yeah, like and, and, and when I watch her, I really, and that is written, you know what I mean? The, the, the monologue is written like, um, yeah, okay, so the thing about being yourself is uh, like, uh, wait, I'm, I'm reading this off a piece of paper. The ums and yeahs are in the script. Yes, yeah, okay. it's very intentional. I can show you eight takes where she stumbles in the same exact place, but when I watch it, I really do see her 
thinking, and that is all to the credit of Elsie, Elsie Fisher, the actor that's playing that role. Um, I feel like I see a kid struggling to think and, and verbalize that, and that's incredibly powerful, and it's all, all her. And so much of that is interior, which is hard. I mean, we have a mm. lot of content that centralizes around adolescence or is geared towards it as an audience is bombastic. Uh, it's larger than life and it's fantasy or it's like, you know, 32-year-old Pilates instructors <laughs> talking to each other by yes. lockers. Yes. And we miss a <laughs> yes, lot of... Yes, 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 I totally... We miss a lot of the granular, like, mm. this is every moment of my life just being a middle schooler it feels insanely intense. Exactly. How did you tap into that? Yeah, well, that, that that's sort of why I think, like, kids connect to Harry Potter, for example, is not because it's escapism. I think it's realism. To them, walking over and talking to your crush feels like walking over to slay the basilisk. It feels that intense. So part of the movie was like, can you somehow get those feelings out of what is a, the normal circumstances of a kid's life? Um, and yeah, like, part of, the, I think, the struggle of the, of the character in the movie and the mo is feeling like I am failing to deliver in the way the cultural standard sort of sets for me, which that cultural standard, for the most part, is set by movies. Like you said, 30-year-old Pilates instructors going like, I'm a freshman. <laughs> no, you're not. It's like you're, you're, you're 27. <laughs> um, and that, that's, imp that's, that's important not just like visually. It's important like the way an actor, we didn't want it to feel like someone looking back on their experience. And you can feel that when it's an older actor, that I'm going to be a kid now. So I'm going to play a kid, you know, as opposed to like, <laughs> oh. be that age. I don't know, I don't know what the hell, some like 19, it's like 1920s like peel, pinwheel hat thing going on. Um, but like, we wanted to feel not like, not like a kid or anyone looking back on their experience, but someone looking out from within their experience. And, you know, Elsie, Graduated eighth grade, a week later we started filming. A week after we stopped filming, she went to her freshman year of high school, which is like, she's in it. And she didn't get into her school play. That's the story I was, which is true. I know, I heard her say in an interview too that she, right. That's true. That, yeah. That, and, I t and I say, Mr. Donia from Thousand Oaks High School is a, is a piece of shit. <laughs> that's his real name. That's his, that's a real man's name. <laughs> don't harass him on the internet though, okay? Um, <laughs> how? I don't think he, he's very, I don't think he has internet access. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. He doesn't know about this movie at all. He's no, fine. yeah. No, he's, he's downstairs in the elliptical right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, a lot of uh, how Elsie uses these, these videos is to cope. Um, and to, to express yourself, how did you first use the internet back when it was like YouTube as a starting phenomena and MySpace? Yeah, right? yeah, that... yeah, 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 I know. When I, say, when I say I was on MySpace to kids, I feel like I'm being like, and I, and I went on MySpace and I bought a hamburger for a nickel. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. like I truly sound like that old. Um, <laughs> But like at that time, the internet was much more like a bulletin board. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It was sort of like you got something cool, post it. Like just show what you have. And now it's much more a place to live and be. Um, like MySpace, it was like, you know, you got a profile picture in your top eight friends, which was insane. But you, you, they, and like some of your interests list them. And now it's Twitter, Instagram. What do you look like? What do you think? What do you look like? What do you think? So the, the internet asked much baser questions of us now, I think. And YouTube at that time, it really was a place to like, you got a little skit or something, put it up there. But the sort of world of what she's doing, which is like really represent yourself and, and be in theory transparent and honest. That, that, that is new and that's yeah. not, that, not something I was doing at that age. Okay, it, it feels like these are two ends of kind of a, a, a wider gap in how we might think of the internet. Um, how did you approach that divide and the way it separate keeps them from connecting. Yeah, I'm right between them. You know? Yeah, like I am 13 years apart from either. Um, you know, she's 13. I'm, you know, I was 26. It's 27 at the time, and you know, he's 13 years older than that. Um, I won't say his age. I'll just heavily imply it with simple arithmetic. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, uh, yeah, so I felt like both of them. You know what I mean? I felt like a scared young kid on the internet, and I felt like an out of touch dude that has no idea what she's going through, and all I can do is be like, keep going. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I hope you're all right or something. So, um, yeah, so I feel like, I, I feel like that. Because I, I, I had to sort of give voice to my own limited perspective, which is that I, I don't know what these kids are going through as much as I feel like it. I feel like the eld I feel like the elder an elder of the internet generation, you know what I mean? I'm just like the f 
oldest internet person that has gotten to get here first to be able to make something about it. But I think as you see more young people start to get power and be able to make stuff, you'll see the internet talked about in more subtle terms and rather, and not so much in the terms that it's talked about now in, cu in culture, which to me it feels like the equivalent of like a Taco Bell commercial where it's like hashtag Chalupa. You know I mean? like, <laughs> that's like honestly how I feel like the internet is talked about. It's like very like, just feels old and dusty and strange. Yeah, there's a lot of commentary about the internet. Yes, exactly. Uh, and that seems to not actually quite understand how people are using the internet. Yeah, exactly, I exactly. It's, it's way too much commentary, not enough description. There's, we, don't, we haven't even gathered the raw materials to have a conversation about it. If you are floating above the internet looking down on it, you actually have no first person experience to talk about it. And if you actually experience it, you'll find that participating in the internet and being within it robs you of your ability to articulate something long form. It is very, very tough to talk about it. Um, and, and also, even for the people that do understand it, for me, like, trying to satirize the internet is just toothless. It just doesn't work, because, like, Geico is commercials are satirizing the internet. Old Spice commercials are satirizing the internet. So, like, how is that cool? What, you know what I mean? Like, do you know what I'm saying? To, to, for me to do a sort of high wire, fast paced, crazy satire of the internet is talking about the internet on the internet's terms. And I think we wanted to talk about it in the way that, in the, way that the internet ignores, which is the internet ignores maybe sort of quieter, gentler moments. Yeah, and there's, so there's something that I feel like. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> if you're a quieter, gentler, average person, mm. there is a pressure to be something bigger, to live something prettier, and also yeah. an intentionality of you know, putting something out there in a way that feels like you are locking in to a sense of self. Mm. Um, I guess building off of, you know, you, you have things you did in 2006 when you were 16, mm -hmm. right? That yeah. are still out there in the world. Mm -hmm. How does that feel to be, in, in your research, a teenager now feeling like everything I put out that isn't on Instagram stories or Snapchat is kind of my personality profile forever. Yeah, well, I've tried to just very, you know, people that don't know, I posted a lot of YouTube videos when I was in, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, funny songs, which like, funny, edgy songs, which like the edgy, you know, comedy of a 16 year old in 2006 does not really square with the cultural moment of 2018, pretty clearly, <laughs> no, really, or, or square with me personally now. Um, so I've tried to, you know, be pretty transparent about that and say like, I'm sort of living out loud like a lot of us are, and I'm growing, yeah. and I'm changing. And yeah, I, for, my issue is more, I, I don't know, I try not to think about this sort of like me. I think everyone has this pressure to sort of like think of their own brand and their own narrative and where they're going and what they represent. And, and all, focusing on that too, too much for me has just led to anxiety and sort of oblivion. And it's much better for me to just sort of take moments as they come, try to be forgiving of myself. We're going to get to a moment where every presidential candidate has the embarrassing stuff they did when they were 14 and 15 all over the internet. And we're going to have to do some sort of like amnesty program where we're just like, <laughs> we're just like everyone's good or, or something. I, I don't know. Um, so that, that's the balance is like we should absolutely be holding people accountable, but can we also allow young people to, and everyone to, you know, live and fail and learn? I don't know what the balance is. There's something, there's something fraught right now without getting too into the news of just mm. being able to be hung on those past mistakes. Has that ever, has it, is that something you've ever encountered or do you feel like you're dishonest and you're like, I don't apologize for being an idiot at 16? I apologize for being an idiot Oh, you do? Oh, no, I totally do. You do apologize. I'm not going to delete the videos because I just actually feel like that's me pretending like I wasn't that. And I want to be an example for people to show like, you can start here and yeah. get there. I mean, I disavowed these, the things I would publicly trash talk my old stuff before anyone cared to even, you know, no one even cares who I am, so they weren't talking about it. But like, yeah, I mean, I'll disavow literally anything I did like <laughs> eight months ago. I mean, like from then to the beginning, I'm like, I, I'm trying, you know? So yeah, um, but I understand it. I, underst I certainly understand in the cur current cultural moment when it feels like the infrastructure of America has absolutely no justice built into it that we're kind of trying to seek justice in other places. So I absolutely understand that. Yeah, um, and how did your parents, so we have building off of her, uh, parents now dealing with the internet, how did your parents first. It was more of a wild west at that point. Yeah, I just remember my mother storming in and being like, you need to take those things down. <laughs> and it was, which is funny. I don't know why I did my mother like some weird like, <laughs> like far side cartoon, but um, she, yeah. Uh, 
No, they were cool. They were fine. I got a, I got a fun family that's all right. They just were okay. worried about like, my mother was worried about the truth, which is like, this is gonna be up here forever and you're immortalizing your 16 year old sensibilities. Uh, what, what if you go for a job interview in, in, when you're 29, you know what I mean? Which is why my real name's Robert, because my mother, they wanted to call me Bo the entire time, but my mother wanted to give me the name Robert in case I became a doctor, and I became the opposite of a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so they have that concern, which is understandable, but, but yeah, it, I don't know. I, I wonder, I, I wonder if that's uh, bad or not. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about gender differences? Also, you know, the Minecraft versus Souls thing, or the way Boys in general seem to ha seem to have an easier time at high school, but I think if we're talking to more evolved adult men now, that's not always the case. Things are kind of under this "I don't have feelings" mm. veneer. Um, how do you feel like there are gender differences in using the internet uh, mm. as an outlet or otherwise? Yeah, I wonder. Uh, like, I definitely think just observing it, it appears that the internet and just culture asks way deeper questions of young women than it does young men at a very early age. Um, you know, young men are just kind of asked like, what do you like? And young women are asked like, who are you? Very, very quickly, and that's what I was sort of interested in. I also think like, just having been around hundreds of 13 year old kids, like the self-awareness is just turned on way quicker in girls. I don't know if it's innately, culturally, whatever it is, like they just are aware of themselves in a way that the boys, I, I wasn't until I was a sophomore in high school, but, um, yeah, I'd, it's also like, you see like the school dances and the, the boys are like four inches sh shorter than the girls <laughs> and they're like, you know, it's very awkward. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I think that stuff is changing super, super quickly. Super quickly. Um, I've noticed just like in the last five years of touring colleges and seeing kids that, the, that I don't know, they, they're taking that, I, I don't even want to speak with authority on that because like really I tried in the movie to just provide a platform for them to express that truth, not for me to be in charge of it. Yeah, know? it seems like you wanted to avoid being instructive with this. There's yeah. not, you know, it's, it's, it's t a taste of the experience, but not a lesson in how to handle it on for parents or kids. Did you, was it intentional that you didn't stay away from moralistic kind of messaging? Yeah, just no like finger wagging. I don't like that. I don't, I don't, I didn't want to make anything prescriptive. You know, it's like, this is just descriptive subjectively. Like the only thing I know about the current moment is how I feel within it and how sh we, her and I feel. And we're just going to kind of describe our feelings and maybe give raw material for a conversation to be had after the movie's scene, but not for the movie to have the conversation. I, I don't know, just like when, when, I don't know, when pieces of media and things about the internet get really instructive or like pedagogical or whatever, I just like get sick to my stomach. I just can't, I'm like, what are you, know? like, what are we talking about? Like, it just so, fu like, the culture's on fire. Everything's upside down. We have no idea what's going on, right? Obviously, <laughs> right? you know what I mean? Like, it's like the same people that were proven so wrong 18 months ago or 20 years ago, wherever that thing happened that we all know happened. Um, and now they're all speaking with certainty, you know? Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm in the internet as much as anybody, and I don't, I, I can't begin to describe it in that way. Is that, that's why maybe one of the biggest gaps is that sense of, of having any kind of authority on a thing that we're all still experiencing in real time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the, the movie that she's scrolling through Instagram, and I love it because it's not some dumb bullshit like shooting across the screen and like whizzing, and there's like yeah, a yeah, tweet, yeah. like there's like a bird. <laughs> yes, there's just yes, yes, so yes, much yes. bad yeah, yeah, it's awful. internet in movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, did, was, that was, seems like it must have been intentional. It's, Feels like it's done with some care. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't like when like the little tweet pops up on the screen or whatever. You know, when they superimpose text on. I think there's it like looks, haptics happening. It's just corny. Yeah. It's like why is the movie is now a computer? I, I don't get it. Um, <laughs> and, but it, people are very. It felt like film is sort of like a little bit phobic of screens and technology, and I don't get it. Like Barry Lyndon writing a letter by candlelight is the most cinematic thing in the world, but like a young girl on her phone in the dark, which is literally like the candle and the letter are fused and it's one thing, like that's super cinematic and beautiful. And um, so yeah, we, we wanted to capture them practically. So all the screens are practical, uh, no screen replacements, 
Also, it's the real internet, the real sites. I knew if she logged on to friendbook.com, we were dead. Like, <laughs> truly, like, dead. When that stuff shows up in movies, you're like, it's over. Just, I'm like, this is, this is not alive anymore. Um, but that means, like, you know, our production designer was making 200 fake Instagram accounts, and we were fake messaging her in, and figuring out the timestamps and how to sync all that stuff. It was, it was an absolute nightmare, but, but I... But, uh, then you got happy. to play Anya over it, so it all came well, to Anya, fruition. Yeah, uh, yeah Anya is yeah. like... Orinoco Flow, which is like a, one of the most beautiful songs ever. Like, I just think Enya knew what the internet sounded like like 30 years <laughs> ago. And you, you tend to see the internet like scored with like hacker music that's like, down, 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 down. It's like, to me, the internet's deep. That was the Seinfeld theme. It was, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's good. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but. The internet to me is spiritual and meaningful, and so I wanted something that endowed it with like a sense of, like it's a religious experience, not like it's like Tron or The Matrix, you uh -huh. know what I mean? Which is like the only way we sort of felt it before. Um, yeah, and Enya does that, and Enya's got like, yeah, it's like harps that sound like a, a, like that yeah. sound like synths. It's crazy. She's a she's, <laughs> she's a genius. And I we had to write a letter to her, and I didn't know how to get. I'm like, how do you get a letter to Enya? I was like, <laughs> I was like, do I write a letter and like attach it to a salmon and like put it in the? <laughs> I was like, I'd like, how does one get in contact with Enya? <laughs> Amazing. Out. Can you talk about Elsie, who played Kayla, or this Gabe? Both like, of them are great. I mean, like, to there. me, it's like just the foggy. The foggy goggles mean a lot to me. You know what I mean? Because everyone always defogs them in movies, but the fog, that's the, that's, that's the whole meaning of the movie. Um, it's like, like the fog and a pair of those goggles. That's about as meaningful as anything. Um, yeah, Elsie Fisher plays uh, Kayla. Like, you know, we saw hundreds of kids, and the movie was truly meaningless until she started reading it. Because it's about a shy girl, a girl who's voted most quiet in her class. Uh, which was a superlative I really had growing up, which was yes. most shy. That seems yeah. so cruel. I know, and people don't, well, people don't realize that like shy people do not self-identify as shy, truly. <laughs> and that shy, what she understood, which none of the young actors understood, because of course, young actors, you think you have to be exuberant, and when they would go in to play the part, every other actor, they would play, it felt like a confident kid pretending to be shy. And when she would play it, it felt like a shy kid pretending to be confident, which is what the role is. Shyness isn't cowering in a corner and not wanting to speak. Shyness is wanting to speak at every moment and not being able to. That's what anxiety is. Um, it's not, it, she made it active. I don't see Elsie playing Kayla. I, when I watch it, I see Kayla playing all the people she wants to be in every moment to whatever, navigate whatever situation she's in. So she's just incredible and like, just I amazing. And you know, the, the, the plot of the movie for me happens behind her eyes and between her ears, and that's provided f fully by her. Gabe, who's Jake, uh, whose real name is Jake Ryan, for any older people, that's the name of the character in 16 Candles, and like, <laughs> people, his real name is Jake Ryan. He's incredible, and he came in and we did a test with him and Elsie, a little chemistry test, or like an anti-chemistry test, whatever we were looking for. and. Uh, there was a scene where it was, uh, I had them improvise and just, just for the audition and he was like, he goes, do you like tacos? And she goes, I like tacos. And he goes, hard shell or soft? And I went, you have the part. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like you got it, dude. Like, and I was like, just don't talk to each other. Like, we did a lot of rehearsals with her and Josh because that's the only sort of um, dynamic that's familiar to her, you know, that like her and her father is the only dynamic that she's been through. But everyone else we tried to keep separate so that we could kind of capture the sort of excitement of them meeting on the day. Yeah. But I would rehearse all the scenes with me and her. And I would rehearse with the other kids, me playing Elsie and, and them playing oh, okay. all the other kids. And then like at the very last minute I'd just pull myself out, you know, and then you'd get something which was rehearsed because I knew I knew what the consistency was, but it but it was new. And did you you did you limit how how frequently you gave out scripts so everything was kind of fresh yeah, and stumbly? Yeah, Elsie read it once fully okay. um, when after she got the role and like read it with her and her father. So like you're very clear about the content of this. So you're comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, only got the we did rehearsals, but only got the pages on the day. Every morning we'd get the pages. She has a freaky photographic memory. She can read something once and just get it. But I just didn't want her to sit around like over baking it or cooking it in her head. And that was the best advice I got as a director um, was being told like, don't direct this thing a hundred times in your head. Don't show up with like some precious idea of what this movie is or you're gonna miss what's actually presenting itself to you. 
um, in the moment, which was hu such, such good advice. Yeah, and so you had to, you are reacting to her on some level. What did she teach you about the character or change how you thought about the movie as a whole? I mean, everything. It's like everything. And she, she just authors every moment. I mean, she's not, even though she's not improvising, like, I, I don't know. I guess, I guess my fears were just washed away that, that, that oh, is this girl going to feel inactive or blank or passive? And she didn't. She just imbued her with sort of everything that was needed. So I don't know. It just felt very right and intuitive. And, you know, people think, people watch the movie, and because she's so natural in it, they think I made like Homeward Bound. It's a dog movie. They think it's like, <laughs> you mean, they think it was like, just do you, and then I'll make a movie around you, and they have no idea that a movie's even going on. It was not the case. <laughs> not the case. Yeah. She is a, she's like Jenna Rowlands or something. She's just like an incredibly talented technical actor. Some of the extras were like Homeward Bound. <laughs> I mean, some of them were, <laughs> they were sort of just like, but that was, that was the best part, for them to just be like wild and not even know what's happening. That was great. Uh, and how did you avoid like, you know, if, like a pool party scene, I've heard you talk about a little bit, but you know, we see a pool party scene, it's like, oh, I know what this is gonna be. And it feels instead as if she is entering it with this, she doesn't have, she's 27 thinking about what a pool party yeah. was. Mindset, she's exploring what it might be like to be in a bathing suit when she is in eighth grade, which is horrible. Well, yeah, yeah, yes. And, and now, I mean, now it's horrible. <laughs> like, I don't want to go to a pool party now. Um, <laughs> it's an oxymoron to me, that, that term. Um, I, 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 yeah, part of it was like trying to see this, just try to, because, again, because it was a girl and because it was set now, I just had to walk it with her for the first time. I wanted to walk her experiences with her as she did, not, because when you remember these things, like you remember them as cultural moments and cultural like touchstones. So it's like, oh yeah, pool party, of course. Of course pool parties. It's like, no, no, no. Try to clear your head of that and actually see it as she sees it, which is how it is, which is like, okay, it's like, all these people I know, we're, our bodies are exploding, we're half dressed, there's a hole in the ground filled with water. It's like, <laughs> how is this happening? You know what I mean? Like, how is this legal? Um, really, like, it's just, you know, and that, that's how we try to see every situation as surreal and visceral as it presents itself. Um, it's a, and, and the other side of it is a weird, weird thing, which is like, for all post John Hughes generations, myself included, it's like, a really weird thing of growing up for me is like by the time I got to the sort of like big moments and, and milestones of my childhood, I had seen them represented so much in movies and television that when I, whenever I'm in them, I'm like floating above myself, judging myself, going like, like I had seen a first kiss on so many times by the time I got to my first kiss, I was like, here it is, that thing I've seen in movies a hundred <laughs> yeah. times. And I get to prom going like, this is prom? Like, wait, <laughs> where, but what's, what, what's the moment gonna happen when the thing happens? You, know you know how prom gets disrupted by that big climactic thing that always happens at prom? You know, and, and, and it's not. Where's the dance number? Is it, yeah, <laughs> and where's like the a, a kid like, you know, gra grabbing a banner and saying he loves a girl or something, whatever, I don't know. Like, <laughs> It's, uh, weddings have a similar feeling uh, as that too, which is you get to a wedding and you're like, oh, this wedding is imitating weddings it's seen in movies. <laughs> so weird, which is, at one point movies were trying to represent reality and now reality is representing, is trying to imitate movies representation of reality. I have no idea where I'm going with this. <laughs> but it's an interesting, you know what I'm saying? I know, I know people feel this way. I yeah. know people feel this way. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more question then we're gonna open up to audience questions if you guys wanna think of something good. Uh, what do you, is that part of what you hope that, you know, maybe younger viewers take from this is like detaching from performing for the expectation? I mean, beside, yeah, beside legislation outlawing pool parties. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What do you hope comes from No, it? I don't want them to take away anything. You know I mean, I just want them to feel hopefully like it's honest and maybe it feels like them. I don't necessarily think like performance is bad. I don't think her videos are a lie. I think trying to speak your truth into existence is beautiful. I think trying to live out loud before you live in the real world might be the productive way to go about it. And who you wish to be is actually probably a more beautiful and vulnerable truth than who you fear you might be. And I think people are way quicker nowadays to admit their fears and their hopes. So I think that's beautiful. But I just hope it, I hope they maybe feel recognized. That, that, that's all. I'm not trying to like, I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong. I, I, I have no idea how to navigate the current moment. 
Um, and there's a lot to disassociate from right now. It makes a lot of sense. And I look at kids on their phone, and my first instinct isn't why, is, why are they on their phone? It's like, yeah, why would you want to look up at the world right now? <laughs> really, for real. Like, of course. Look at the world you made for these kids to look up at. No wonder they're burying their head in the sand. On that very light note. <laughs> Um, I think that we just are going to have people raise their hand. It's just like a wild west. The girl in the hat. Yeah, stand up and I'll repeat it if we can't hear you. Thank you so much. Your work has been very important to me. Appreciate it. You know what, I was, I was, I had like a little, my comedy was starting at that time, um, you know, when, when I was a senior in high school, there was a, there was a most likely to be famous, most likely to make a million dollars, most likely to be successful, I got most likely to be on a reality show. I didn't get, I didn't get most funny or anything, like I got a big, can we swear? Yeah, I I got a big so. fuck you for my class too. That is awful. That is re that is awful and that's sexist too. You're gonna name a best selling memoir that one day though. I'm did ready. They have for a guy did they did, did they did they name a guy to live with most cats? No. Oh no, of course they didn't have a guy equivalent. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's unbelievable. That's that is awful. That's really bad. And like and you know what's and you know what's bad I'm sorry to keep cutting you off. What's what's really bad is that it's it's like funny. You know, that, that's actually what's being used against you in that moment. Like, take the joke, it's funny, right? No, but it's completely obliterating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Best dressed, it's like richest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They were right. They were right. They were right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I appreciate your question. Um, that's, uh, that really sucks about the most, the 20 cats thing. No, it really does. No, it really does. And like the laughter is the problem. Like that really sucks. I, I'm sorry about that. Can I tell the yearbook committee you told me that? What? Can I tell the yearbook committee you told me that? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not going to help, but it's not, trust me, I'm not, I, I don't help as much as you think I do. Um, um, you know, what isn't in your head? I mean, that's my, my question to people. You know what I mean? Like, in your head is a dismissive thing is hilarious uh, because, you know, nothing is significantly experienced if it doesn't register in your head. Yeah. If it never makes it in your head, it's actually irrelevant. Um, and I'm saying, of course, there are real world problems, but of course, the way they actually affect in, the way they register to someone subjectively is in our head. The universe is in our head, so I, I don't, quite understand that criticism. Um, you know, I didn't speak it out loud until I was 23, 24. You know what I mean? I didn't say the word to myself. M I, I, this movie was more me admitting it to myself than anybody. Like, I was afraid to, I thought if I said it out loud, I would make it real. And it was the exact opposite. So like, you're ahead of me being where you are at your age, even admitting it to yourself and admitting it out loud. Everyone's got their own stuff going on, you know? And um, so, so I, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to deal with it other than to speak it and keep speaking it and don't try to rid the personal shame of having it. Um, you I, have I a couple ways you kind of encountered it, maybe even uh, you have, if you want to talk about on stage, um, how did you first deal with having anxiety about performing when yeah. you're loving um, to perform and do I, that. Yeah, you can sit if you want to sit. You don't have to, if, if you feel like standing, good. Can you see it? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I know. I mean, panic attacks on stage in front of three thousand people. You know, multiple panic attacks on stage in from within a show I had written. You know what I mean? It's just insane. So, but anxiety is surreal in any situation. You know, it just it it it, it makes any situ situation feel that surreal. I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to deal with it. Probably, you know, I, pro go to therapy, tr talk about it. I don't do that, but I should. And I, I you know. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I, I, like my, a lot of what I'm doing is actually just trying to shrug and see see recognition in other people and get recognition in other people. So we're actually doing the same thing, and you are providing for me as much as I'm providing for you. Truly. So thank you. Good luck to I us. I think we're gonna do another question now. Um, the girl with the long blonde hair over here. Yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Appreciate it. Do you direct? Have you directed things? Yes, I have. You are a director. Don't go look at it yet. No, it's okay. No, but that's perfect. That's perfect. You are a director. You are an actor. You're not aspiring. You know, it really isn't. You maybe aspire to be a famous one or a successful one. Don't have shame about that stuff. It, it's re it, the, the, if you were really, really happy about the stuff you were making right out the gate, you'd be screwed. You'd be a psychopath. You know, really, no, 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 really. Like that, that shame or, or, or uh, uh, not being worthy you feel about your own material is the creative process, is you getting better. I feel that every step of the process the entire time. So the great thing about the creative process, I know this isn't the answer, this isn't the question you asked is everyone has access to it right away, the best part. It just is true. It took me a long time to realize like, the thing I loved most about doing this is the thing I had access to in sixth grade doing theater. The other stuff's great. The other stuff's super fun to, to pursue. I have gotten very lucky. I'm very grateful to be here. But like, this is at the mercy of everybody else. So I would really say, like, and this is, and I wish I could have told myself this when I was younger, don't wait to be some version of what you think is good until you get to be it and enjoy it. You can enjoy it right now. You can actually be it right now. You can aspire to be seen by more people and be successful, but don't aspire to be a director and an actor. You're, you're directing, you, you, you act, right? Yeah. You're it, you just are doing it, so. Um, and the, and uh, yeah, that's a, and then I struggle getting the money. That's a bad answer. <laughs> the, the first answer's cooler. Uh, um, um, yeah, I, 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 I you know, three years, I, I struggled a lot to get the money for this. I wrote it like three years ago, and then sort of when I made my last special, uh, Make Happy on Netflix, I felt like, okay, I have enough sort of momentum right now where I can get the money to make this. Because I, like, I had kind of sold like the budget's amount of uh, tickets on the road, so I was like, I think I can finally do this. Um, but yeah, good luck with it. I wanted to ask you about something and make happy, actually, if I could. You have a, a line in there that is, if you can live without an audience, you should do it. Um, <laughs> can, can you tell us about that? Well, you know, it's sort of corny. I mean, up there I'm also like being, you know, theatrical and fun and, you know, performing honesty as much as doing honesty. But that's sort of the realization I had very late in my creative life, which was like the moment for me, which, if, um, <laughs> just, never mind. I just so, so violently tried to not say aha moment because I hate when people say <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> was like, you know, I was trying to express what I was going through. I was trying to be honest on stage, which for me, being honest on stage couldn't be like, man, I, my laundry. It was like, no, honesty for me is like, I'm struggling with being on stage in front of all these people staring at me. It's super weird, and it makes me feel super anxious. So I would talk about it, and I was like, well, this is going to be awful, because no one's going to get this unless they're a 24-year-old male comedian with an audience. And I would do the show, and 14-year-old girls would come up to me and say, I feel exactly like you do. And I'd go, what? You know what I mean? I, I really wouldn't understand it. And it's, it ties back to this movie of, if there was a bridge I had to walk to write the movie, it was built by them to me first. I, I felt understood personally by people like Kayla before I presumed to understand someone like Kayla. And it was the thing that, oh, this very specific circumstance of my life, which is the specific stresses of being a D-list celebrity, has now been democratized and given to everybody. <laughs> everybody has a brand. Everybody is their own publicist. Everybody is worrying about their legacy. Everyone's being their own biographer. It's horrifying. And, and But it was the two sides of a coin that one obliterated me, one was my deepest fear, and one actually saved my life, which was, I am not unique and I'm not alone. You know, I was worried, of course, 
what I'm feeling is because I'm so, I'm so deep, I'm so smart, I'm in such a specific, no, no, really. <laughs> I mean, this is like the actual honest thing that's embarrassing to admit. Um, I'm, I'm anxious because I'm just living the coolest life and I'm just so in my head and I'm fucking Ernest, Ernest Hemingway or something. But no, it's not true. I, I'm kind of, my stresses are very, very common and shared by sort of everybody. And it led to this movie, which is that, you know what, if I'm being honest with me, my experience in totality is, e is equal to or less than that of a regular 13-year-old girl. And I believe that. I believe that. That's I awesome. do believe that now and that, that, that helps. So, so that, that's back to your question of like, the problem with anxiety, and I, it can bleed into other sort of mental um, problems as well, is that like, it, dispositionally with people, it tends to select people that are very, want to be a little closed off and singular. And, and, it, and, in, and the feeling of anxiety itself, I've described it as like, it's like riding a bull, and the bull is your nervous system, and you're just trying to hold on. And being in the world, it, everyone else is an equestrian to you, and you're the only one that has to struggle with this thing, and it just isn't true. And, you, and I think the part some anxious people, myself included, don't want to believe is you don't actually want to believe that your experience is shared. You actually want to be alone because it means you're special. And you have to let that go because that is dark, 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 dark. You ended up, I love it. You ended up answering the other question mm. in full. That's perfect. Okay, we have another one. In the front here. Yeah. Um, hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Mm. You, it's very creative, actually. I <laughs> truly. Yeah, yeah, it is actually. Um, I mean, people don't view it that way. Anyway. Yeah. Well, you, you get, you're gonna have to get creative to deal with what's going on now. <laughs> No, 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 it's a great question. It's just too good. They all agree. They're just nervous. It's big. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all. Yes. I just, I contend that all people are racist and sexist and fucked up and like we all sort of internalize these things because we live in this society. So how do we acknowledge that and, and hold people accountable without, you know, with the space to heal? Uh, yeah. I mean, the truth is like the person to give this answer is really not me. Like, no, <laughs> no, 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 truly, truly, truly. Because like... The conversation that's happening right now that I do agree with is that there is at once a shared experience and also a specific experience that um, people with my specific experience demographically tend to speak with a lot of authority in the moment and maybe they shouldn't so often, but here I am in the lights. Um, uh, um, I do believe that the most significant things or some, some of the most significant things are shared. Love, grief, family, pain. I, I, what I don't want to do is I, and again, this is what I don't want. I'm like, please see this as like, open. I'm not really addressing necessarily just you, but anyone that could interpret an answer as wrong. It's also, it, it's crazy the amount of subordinate phrases you need to put before a statement nowadays. But that <laughs> might be right. That might be right because the culture's on fire. I get it. I really do get it. I'm saying like the worst fucking thing happened in the world 18 months ago that set the country on fire. So I get that we went like, we need to like, tear our culture down and look at every piece of it and go, how the fuck did it add up to this? So I, I, I do really get it. And like the friendly fire is not 
at all equivalent to the war that was started. At all, at, at all. Like, we're gonna actually say that like, that fuck face that, I shouldn't be saying this stuff, but like, <laughs> that psycho is equivalent to like some clunky college students that are like saying their opinion a little too loudly. Like, those are equivalent things is absolutely bonkers. But I will say that like, what I, what I don't want, what I like, what I seek out in art, I'm just gonna keep it to art for, for me, for my sake. I personally connect so much with pieces of art and things that I don't demographically align with. That is a really powerful experience for me and like a huge engine for empathy and change. And it's beautiful to see myself in someone that on the surface is nothing like me, which is some, like, something like this story. You know, and I, and I don't want that to go. I don't want the belief to be that we can never understand each other. We, we just, you, you know, yeah. I, there of course are certain, certain circumstances and life experiences that cannot be understood and we need to listen to each other. And specific groups need to step back and listen to other groups. But of course there's a shared humanity that we can all talk about, right? Right, like, we, I'm, you know what I mean? Like we all, <laughs> we all have, parents that are like dying mm -hmm. we all you know we're all trying to love each other we're yeah. all like hearts in chests and brains and heads so th that that is I, I i don't i don't know though it's 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 crazy it's well, it's crazy times but i i i get it i i, I get why it's crazy when, when the shit happened november 2016 i was like it's over it's over and what you might be seeing is like it's it's over but, you, know, you know, like, <laughs> we have to tear down everything. We have to, like, I was literally thinking, like, okay, all the shows are canceled. Like, there's no way I'm going to see another fucking talk show again in my life, let alone I saw twice as many, you know? So, like, there's way less culture tearing down than I, exp than I, than I expected. I think people are being very well behaved for what <laughs> is actually happening. The, in, I think in your question, there's, oh, there's okay. something about decency where people are being held accountable to certain standards of decency when they subscribe to them. And just the fact that he's still fucking president is proof of that, right? So well, how, it's, it's, on a lighter well, it's, note... Right now, we're getting caught in people just going, hypocrite, <laughs> hypocrite, <laughs> hypocrite, yeah. hypocrite. You know I mean? That's what's happening right now. Is that like we forgot where the stand? Everyone's just calling each other hypocrites, which is but was, like it's it's I'll, it's Donald Trump. Are we forgetting that like I'll never get over that. I'll never get over that it's Donald Trump. I'm like even the people I'm like yeah, yeah I get it like yeah like snowflakes and you don't like her and Hillary. It's Donald Trump. Like you're on <laughs> you're on board with Donald Trump. Like I, like I no 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 I'll take those arguments. Okay yeah yeah maybe that should be less. It's Donald. <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And I blame comedy for 80% of it. I do. Swear to God. Swear to God. He learned everything he, he needed to learn at the Comedy Central Roast. Learned. It's not a joke. Learned everything. Everything. It's funny. At a personal level, he I won think comedically. the way we can subvert some of that trolling and lack of decency, right, is better remembering how to be humans when we're using the internet. And I'm, I guess we probably have time for one last question after this, but can you talk? You can't be a human on the internet. You You're can't. not going to out-tweet Donald. You're not, it doesn't, it's his medium. What are you talking about? We're having a national conversation by throwing fortune cookies at each other. The antidote for him isn't better tweets. It's long-form conversation. Right? I mean, it's his medium. What the fuck are you talking about? Of course this stuff is reductive. It's literally reductive. It's 160 characters. <laughs> but, but of course, you know what I mean? Of course, yeah. like, they're, they're, they're to, the, like, it's, it's the mediums. It's the mediums. That's the problem. It's probably not the people. You know what I mean? That, that's the problem. It's people thinking it's people versus people. And it's mediums. It's people sli literally sliding fortune cookies to each other, trying to have an argument about complex, giant things. No wonder it's uncivil. And we're going to turn the tweets up. Let's tweet them out of, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> right? Doesn't it feel a little crazy? I don't know. Should it be regulated? This should not be streamed on live. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, of course it should be regulated. They should be... It should be. There is no proof that we should be actualizing this stuff. 
You go, it takes 30 minutes, it takes, you know, 30 minutes to get to work on a horse and carriage. Then we make a car, it takes 15 minutes. Great, make a faster car, great. Cleaner energy, make it quicker. Why should we apply that to our social lives? Why should we apply that to our conversation? Is there any proof that streamlining this stuff makes it better? You can talk to 100 people, now you can talk to 1,000. You can have a conversation. There's no, we, we're, we're applying a like, capitalist whatever like streamlining logic to literally our emotions and our souls and that just happened that's a that's a shift from the, like the internet was the super the internet super highway where it's like libraries are everywhere and now it's literally our well-being being churned out and our attention is being colonized um, until there will be none left crazy 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 <laughs> let's do one more question can I, yeah. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Let's do one. We are, I'm pretty sure we're going to get kicked off stage. Mm. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you got some good directorial advice from my uh, music director. Uh, my question is if you weren't able to send your music director to someone, who would you have wanted to Oh, good question. Um, I, I mean, I wrote it to direct it, but this is a great question. Um, Julia DeCorna, who directed Raw. Oh, yeah. That would be, that would okay. be. I saw Raw three times in theaters. That would have been her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was a quick hand. <laughs> wow. Would I like a photo? I, I mean, it'd be very. <laughs> okay. The only thing weirder than asking it would be saying no, so. <laughs> Appreciate it. Wow, okay. Thank you guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we went from heavy to light very quickly, so it's good. Okay, well, great. I think that's the show. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh.